All right, well, here's a few news articles you might like. This thing called Rumble. Uh, apparently, I think it comes from Rapid7. Anyway, uh, it looks pretty good. This is something that automatically finds all the devices on your network. And there's a free trial and some kind of free home version. So uh, this would be a good thing to do just to try it out. I may make a project out of it. It's considered a very good to have continuous scanning of your network so you know if people are adding uh, unexpected devices or opening unsafe ports on devices and so on. Uh, this is an interesting idea. They're claiming that if you cough and you have COVID, it has a particular sound to your cough, which they claim they can detect to some very high degree of accuracy with AI. So if that's true, this would be a very easy thing to do to screen people before they go into a movie theater or an airplane or something, uh, much better than using a temperature, which is what people are using now. Well, the problem with the temperature, of course, is it's very likely to you're very likely to not have a temperature and still be contagious with COVID. And it depends on how much you've been walking around and stuff. It's really a pretty miserable method of uh, detecting COVID. So something like that would be better if it works. So yeah, this is really pretty interesting. This is something I've seen before. This nice clear graph. Um, there is something very strange about Trump. Like his popularity is just completely flat. It doesn't matter what he does. And he said, you know, I could just pull out a gun and shoot somebody in the street and nothing would happen. And that appears to be true. You have a pandemic, you have scandal after scandal, none of it ever touches him. The Americans love Trump in some non-transactional, non-judgmental way. A bunch of people just love him no matter what he does. And they've interviewed him and said, is there anything he could do or say that would make you stop supporting him? And they say, no, I'm always for him. They love him the way people you love a king, not the way the rest of the presidents are just guys you hire to do a job. And then your satisfaction depends on how well they're doing at the job. So it goes up and down, but not Trump. It really is a new thing in America to have this kind of president. The way people support him is very different than what we've had before. So this is something. I know a lot of people building gadgets with Raspberry Pi, and now they give you a keyboard with a Raspberry Pi built into it, and so uh, for 100 bucks. So this is just a portable small computer you could use for many purposes. Uh, this is what I thought when they came out with the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64, you know, 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. Yeah, 40 years ago, but it was a big thing. This computer that wasn't too expensive, that was small enough you could build into things so you could start automating all kinds of gadgets. So anyway, they're saying this might be good for students working at home. All you do is connect it to a TV or something. That's how we used to use the Commodore 64. So anyway, it's uh, we'll see what people do with that. This I was very interested to see. Um, coronavirus is a retrovirus, which means it does not have any DNA. All it has is RNA. And the thing about RNA is when you uh, reproduce, it does not have, normally when you reproduce with DNA, you have a second pass after reproduction to fix the errors, like error correction. So the amount of mutation is incredibly small. But in RNA, there is no error correction and the mutation rate is very fast. So COVID mutates every two weeks. And this shows the infections around Houston and the red areas have 50 different strains of COVID infecting people. The blue areas have none. So it's, um, it is very interesting. And this is, um, you know, this is the way RNA retroviruses are. So it's, uh, yeah, the Atari 800, you have the same kind of thing. Yeah, these portable devices. Anyway, so it's mutating like crazy. And uh, this, you know, it could get worse. It could get better. This is probably our only, this is how it will end in America since we have abandoned all hope of containing it and we're doing absolutely nothing to stop the spread. Then it's going to just go the way it would have in the Middle Ages. It'll just blow through the country until it mutates on its own to a form that is more infectious and less lethal. And that will act like a natural vaccine and that'll be the end of it. That's how these things tend to burn out. So uh, if we continue to do absolutely nothing to contain it, um, it'll probably be a couple of million Americans it'll kill, but then, but we're just waiting for this random mutation to happen and no one knows when it'll happen. Of course, it could mutate to a more lethal form too. But anyway, um, uh, or maybe we could uh, have a different administration and actually make some attempt to control it. Uh, but uh, we'll be deciding that tomorrow. So there's a new attack here, a new uh, zero day. This is a, uh, 
Google found this vulnerability and they gave Microsoft just one week to patch it, which is much less than usual. They normally give you 90 days and Microsoft did not put out a patch. And so now there are people exploiting this zero day vulnerability, but it's only a privilege escalation vulnerability and they don't usually take those very seriously. There's tons of them. It's in the Windows kernel cryptography driver in the uh, cng.sys. So if I had a little more information, this would make a good project for the malware analysis class. We're doing kernel debugging and kernel hacking. So it'd be fun, but there isn't enough, there isn't any proof of concept yet. And anyway, so they say it's really not that big a deal. Uh, and Microsoft will have a patch out in a couple of weeks. So we'll see what comes of it all. Edward Snowden has a wife in Russia now and a child coming in Russia. So he decided to become a Russian citizen. Uh, so that is probably the best plan for him. His lawyer said years ago, don't come back here. I can't protect you. His crimes here are the sort that he's not likely to get forgiven or and pardon you only. Trump said he would pardon him, but apparently not. So short of a presidential pardon, I think he has no hope of coming back here and staying out of prison. So probably he's doing the right thing. Just settle down in Russia and stay there. Now, I don't know why the Russians are letting him stay. I hear persistent rumors that he is, of course, handing them military secrets. But uh, as far as I know, Trump didn't change his mind, but Trump just said it and then he didn't do it. You know, Trump says a lot of things. He throws things against the wall and then, you know, um, maybe Trump will pardon him. But I, my impression of Trump is that if, if, if something slips out of his mind, he just forgets about it and moves on to the next thing. Haven't heard him talking about Kanye West for a while. You know, I think, I think Trump uh, has a short attention span. So there's a high school contest, um, Cyber Start America. You have to be a high school student, and then there's a puzzle solving game, and you get uh, scholarship funds if you succeed. So that sounds interesting. It's um, funded by National Institute of Standards. So I'm not quite sure exactly what the result is or what you get or how good it is, but it's probably a good idea if you know anybody in, in high school that would like to check it out. That sounds like a fun thing to try. Um, we have high school program in the summer for teaching students cybersecurity, but uh, I guess uh, we missed this one. Anyway, we'll see what comes to that. Chrome is gonna have its own dedicated root certificate root store, independent from the operating system. Until now, it's just used the operating system's root certificates. So I'm not quite sure what the point is. I guess this makes it more consistent across different devices, but it also is irritating to enterprise customers because this means now you have to maintain two root stores because you typically have to add some root certificates to the store so people can reach your company website because you're using a private route and you probably want to block some routes from the store to block other sites and stuff. So, you know, it's just, anyway, that's where we're going. Chrome is going to have its own certificate root store. Um, and Cyber Command is uh, exposing Russian malware and, attri and attribution and putting samples up where people can get them for virus total. So this is good for people who want to start studying malware and finding out where it comes from. And, I'm getting more and more interested in that. So I'm glad to see the United States releasing more of their um, information to identify this stuff. In the past, it's been very annoying. Like they claimed that North Korea hacked Sony and they wouldn't give us the information. So we couldn't independently verify that. So a lot of people didn't believe it. Now it appears to have been true, but since they wouldn't show us the evidence, it was hard to convince people. Anyway, so let's uh, get down to the official stuff here. This is 152. And uh, we got more, by the way, we have more guest speakers coming. I just got an email today. I uh, remember Stephen Booth from FireEye came a few weeks ago. He has a bunch more people like him that want to come give us talks. And uh, so we're expecting to have another one on November 9, which would be next week, and another one on December 14 and on November 24. So more details will be coming. So I'll be adjusting the schedule. Uh, I'll have a, a, the name up here. We're probably going to have guest speakers on these days. And I won't give a normal lecture on those days then. So, but I, but if he was very good. Stephen Booth came. So I think a real industry speaker uh, of that caliber is very important. Far better than a lecture for me. And by the way, Tuesday comes Caitlin showing you how to hack satellites. This is going to be awesome stuff. I highly recommend it. That's tomorrow. And those things are worth extra credit if you come to them. All right. So anyway, we're down to this stuff here. Analysis methodology. And this is really, uh, you know, like police investigation, forensic investigation, 
tracking down what's going on when you have a security incident, there is a process. You have to decide what your objectives are, then gather data, and you may have to convert data and uh, perform analysis and evaluate results, and this is just the procedure that you use. The first thing, of course, is defining objectives. Um, you have to understand what you're trying to determine. You're not just going to embark on an open-ended research project. Uh, you're trying to do something that will lead to a goal quickly. So you're trying to determine, you know, how, how have we been attacked? What vulnerability was exploited? How do we kick these people out? That sort of thing. So you figure out um, what you're trying to accomplish and what resources you need and what your customer wants. So you're going to have to decide who is in charge of this. Uh, it is very commonly the case that some you're either a consultant from outside a company or you're working inside a company, but the person who actually determines what's important is somewhat non-technical. They're like business types. So this is an issue. It's been an issue with all these high-tech fields since I started doing fiber optics um, that the customer doesn't even know enough to ask good questions. They don't even understand what your product does very well. So they don't, you can't let them boss you around too much. You have to educate them and say, tell me what you're trying to accomplish and let me tell you what you should use to accomplish that instead of, you know, a, uh, a more passive thing where you'd expect them to just tell you what they want. You have to help guide them into getting what they need. It's the same thing here. So uh, you might have requests to do something ridiculous, like prove that this server was not compromised. And that's essentially impossible. Um, so you because you don't know you don't have audit trails you don't really know what all the software on should be you don't have all the logs you know you never can prove a negative um so you can look for a set of indicators of compromise you can look for certain things and then you can state a reasonable opinion and this is why uh expert witnesses are the one special person in court in court people are only allowed to talk about what they observed witnesses can only talk about what they observed personally but expert witnesses are able to state opinions, and those opinions become evidence. They're the only people that can do that, and that's based on their credibility. So, you know, it's, it's an issue here. Um, so you can form an opinion. This server looks okay to me. I don't think it's been hacked, but you certainly can't prove that. You can just say, if it was hacked, it was hacked by somebody clever enough to hide their tracks from my techniques, and that could be possible. So you can't really say there's no malware. What you can say is certain kinds of malware aren't there. It passed these tests. It is my opinion that it's not malware on there. Um, so, you know, you can't just look at a hard drive and email. You have to have a more defined thing where you're trying to find something. So uh, you have to ask why of the people. Make sure you understand what they're trying to accomplish and then help them accomplish that. Um, Non-technical people will like, blithely say, I want you to clean it so there's no no malware on it. I want you to have no bad people on network. I want you to have the server up 100% of the time. Those sound reasonable to business people, but they're not reasonable to experts. So, all right, then you have to understand the types of data. You have data stored all over the place, laptops, hard drives, uh, thumb drives, iPhones, virtual storage on cloud services and virtual desktops, your servers, of course, a rack mounted in a special server room if you do have physical servers instead of everything being in the cloud. And then you probably have storage area networks that may be elsewhere uh, and mobile devices all over the place. Um, and if you're letting company data go on those devices and you probably are at least letting email go on that to those devices and perhaps even a lot more. And all these other uh, portable devices that might have data on them and all those might have data relevant to your investigation. You have network devices like firewall switches, routers, IDS systems. They typically do not store user data, but they have logs of say attacks and network connections and such that might be important to you. And there's all these cloud services, Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and on and on it goes, Office 365. All these things are out there and you might have to gather data from them to the extent that you can. One great thing about Dropbox is Dropbox stores 30 days of backup copies of every file, even the files you delete, and not everybody knows that, for the enterprise version anyway, so that is really great. So if people try to like delete stuff, it's not gone. And you have backups. Uh, anybody with, uh, any corporation will have a lot of backups. Um, because you know you don't want to lose your data. So they might have local tapes, they might have cloud services like Carbonite, 
and that's a great place to look for things. Uh, here's a case that was sort of interesting. Rudy Giuliani is apparently a drunk. He just does an awful lot of stupid things. And one of the many stupid things he did was he got locked out of his iPhone. So he just went to the ordinary genius bar to get the technician there to let him in his iPhone. And that is why, you know, I wonder if Trump just has a normal iPhone because by they took away Obama's BlackBerry. He loved his BlackBerry and they took it away. They said, you as the president cannot have just a normal consumer grade BlackBerry. That's not secure enough. They gave him a special hardened military device that he had used instead. I don't know if they were able to get Trump to stop using a normal iPhone. Giuliani certainly does. And these people are absolutely handling top secret information and then doing stuff like taking it to just some random staffer in a store, which is absolutely not secure enough. You know, it's a, it's, this is the problem. This is why, you know, when Trump first got in, a lot of the people in his uh, team could not get security clearance and he had to lean on them and get a security clearance because these people don't know how to handle classified data. They aren't reliable. And yet he pushed it through anyway. Um, anyway, so uh, the operating system itself has some information, of course, but most of that you don't care about because it's just system files written by Microsoft. You might care about a log of connections or something. The application store data, and you have the user data in your documents and desktop. That's usually very much what you want. And then your network devices storing uh, information about network connections and such. Let me turn this off so it doesn't keep beeping at me. All right. And... Um, all right, so if you want to copy data from the operating system, you can copy the entire disk, and then you have NTFS for Windows or HFS for um, Mac. And this will have, uh, you can copy the whole hard drive. You could also just get a list of running processes, network connections, and so on. The, each operating system has its own technique. The Windows registry stores all the settings of all the programs in Unix that might be in the syslog and other config files. And Apple has these things called plist files, which are the configuration files for the Apple platform. So if you copy a hard drive, you have allocation units on the drive, which are clusters, typically four kilobytes, which is the smallest unit of disk space allocated to a file. There are active files that are in use. They're in the directory. They have an owner and a name and a creation date. And then there are deleted files that no longer have directory information but the contents of the file are still typically there until they happen to get overwritten. Um, there are timestamps for the active files, but not for the deleted files. And there is unallocated space between the active files that called file slack, and that contains leftover data from previous files that might be of some interest, but it will not have creation dates or owners. And we talked about partition tables. Your drive may be partitioned into various regions and you can decide how many of those you want to image. Uh, so each file system has its different uh, characteristics. Is time stomping feasible with iOS? Um, it's a good question. I would think it is possible, although I don't know what tool you use to do it. Uh, the problem with iOS is you can't really put any hacking tools in the iPhone. So I mean, if you jailbreak it, then I'm sure you could do time stomping because then you get total control of the disk. If not, then you're going to have to hack into the iOS. And there are a few people who can do that, but it's not easy. So uh, I, I say you couldn't do it to a normal person's phone without them knowing. But if you impound the phone, now the old technique used to be jailbreak the phone, then image the whole thing. And you could do that now with, um, with CheckRate. You could jailbreak it. And if you had the user's pass key, Passcode, you could get into the user files, and then I'd say you could even image the whole hard drive. You could totally install utilities and run it. So I'd say now, in the last year and a half since we have check rain, I would say Tom Stomping probably is feasible. It's a good question. Anyway, then TFS, you've got timestamps and data streams and so on, some of the details there. And uh, UFS has these things called inodes. HFS has these resource forks. And back in the old days, it had a file allocation table. These are all just ways of labeling all the files and folders and keeping track of the metadata, like the owner and the creation time and such. And if you really get into making complete disk images and understanding exactly what you've got, then you have to understand these systems. Um, oh, CheckRain. Yeah, CheckRain is the modern jailbreak tool. This was invented by one of my ex-students. Um, This is the new, there it is. This is the new jailbreak for iPhones. Um, he found this and it is 
Very good. This is how you can now jailbreak modern iPhones. For quite a few years, we have not been able to jailbreak modern iPhones, but um, now we can jailbreak a whole bunch of the new ones because he found a vulnerability in the boot up sequence in the hardware that Apple can't patch. So now we can get back into the iPhones. It's very exciting. It greatly improves um, all security tests on iPhones. Anyway, uh, if you want to learn about this, Brian Carrier wrote the Bible for this, File System Forensic Analysis. I've taught classes and we've used this book. It is very detailed. You, it gets right down to bit by bit how files are laid out on the disk, how the directory is structured, and so on. So you can do things like uh, repair corrupted directory entries and such. I taught that for a while, and it seems like in the modern world, it's not that important to go that deeply into the bits and bytes. You can pretty much use tools to do it for you now. But um, that level of analysis is available if you want to get into it. And then, of course, the application-specific artifacts, like your internet browser history, your emails, web logs, and so on, your chat, your IMs, those are often all what people really care about because they show what you were doing. Um, the technical people might like to get into the bits and bytes of how things are stored on the disk, but typically, if you're trying to research what happened, you want to know what the humans did. All right, and that's your user data, spreadsheets, documents, and all that jazz. Um, if you have a Windows environment, you might be storing these locally on the hard drive of each machine, but you typically do not do that at corporations. You use roaming profiles where all this data is stored on the server, and the end device is really just sort of a interchangeable shell, just a portal to the server. And that's, of course, more convenient for the company. You can just get the data off the server, and you do not need to go investigate the end devices. All right, you've got all these servers out there. You have your, all the servers keeping logs like DNS and DHCP. You've got network flow data of the type that we uh, looked at in Splunk in the other classes, and this one too, I think, to some extent, where you're, you're looking at the uh, Splunk stream data and your intrusion detection systems and your firewalls. All those are giving you information about what's been happening. And one good thing about it is it's not dependent on the end device because somebody might steal or wipe the end device, like a, a tablet or a desktop, but you'll still have records on the network of what happened. So um, when you get your raw data, it might be encrypted, compressed, or encoded, or in some custom format. Microsoft in particular, until about 2008, Microsoft loved to make up a binary format for every one of their products. There was this Word document, Excel spreadsheet, and Access. Everything had its own individual proprietary binary format. WordPerfect did, and it was really a drag, and Microsoft finally knocked it off and just switched to XML for everything. So all Microsoft documents are now just plain text zipped with an ordinary zip. So it's easy to reduce them to some form you can search them in. But a lot of other people still use these proprietary binary formats, and that makes it hard to search through stuff. Um, all right. So you have to ask questions. If somebody else provides you data, it might be in a screwy format, and you might have trouble using it. Um, one of the things that used to be a big issue is if you get data, it might be from a system running some kind of obsolete, horrible thing, like some custom word processor on an Amiga or some horrible thing like that. And then you would actually find like local computer clubs where people actually know about these screwy old systems. I don't know how much that's a big problem now. There's you get a big difference between law enforcement and corporations. Corporations usually have a standard device and everybody's using the official company device and they're all the same. Cops have that other problem where they go to a crime scene, they grab stuff, and it's often some bizarre old thing that's hard to image. Anyway, um, all right, so disk images could be encrypted, especially these days when almost every modern operating system encrypts the hard drive by default. Um, and you could have it for something else like a RAID. When you do make a disk image, the most common thing you do is get an expert witness image, E01, because this is compressed and easy to handle. Your open source utilities will make raw files, DD, and your virtual machines wake these VMDK files or other files for different versions of virtualization. Now, those are the common types you find. Um, Encase can handle them all directly. Um, there are plenty of free tools to convert from one type to another for the other formats. <laughs> They're all absolutely identical mathematically. They all have exactly the same image of the drive bit by bit. It's just that they're zipped or laid up in a group of files or something, but the actual contents is exactly the same. And then you have data encoding. 
So this is base64, which just takes every three letters and turns it into four characters using uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, and a couple punctuation marks. That was designed to send binary files through email, which was an ASCII-only medium. And then here you have UU encoding, which is another way to do it. And then here you have the MD5 hash, which is technically a one-way function. In principle, once you've MD5 something, you can't un-MD5 it, but in practice you can if it's uh, short enough, you can guess the answer. But anyway, um, then you have things like this. If you dump things out with the Linux as XXD utility or Wireshark or many others, then you'll have a file here, but it will break it up into rows and put numbers here for how many bytes you are into the file, then the raw bytes, then this. So it still contains the same data, but for example, if you were looking for 16 digits in a row to find a credit card, you won't find them anymore because they're broken by these other things. And this is the kind of thing I used to deal with all the time at the escrow agency. I would have lists of names and addresses and dollar amounts, and it would come in all these weird formats, and you have to write a lot of custom scripts and things to convert it from one format to another. And I saw cases where that was done wrong. So some of the data got garbled and lost in the translation. It's pretty easy to do because the data you get is often somewhat broken and imperfect. So uh, also you've got uh, foreign languages, people in different time zones, people that have set their dates to have the month first in, or the day first and so on. So it's very easy to get the data confused and garbled that way. So once you've got it in, then you know, you've got, um, so if you're worried about data theft, somebody stealing data, you can start with network information. Perhaps you can find some network traffic that looks like that was involved in this, or maybe something on the host, uh, like compression utilities or something that looks unusual. So your network flow data might show a lot of data leaving on a certain day. This I think is how Google caught China hacking and stealing their data. They saw a whole bunch of data flowing out to China to some place that was not their data center. And they said, hey, this looks like somebody in China stealing our data. And that's what it was. Um, you can look at proxy logs and so on, failed login attempts or anything else unusual here. Uh, you can look on the host for logging outside expected hours, doing strange things, uh, connecting to strange places where they shouldn't be going, uh, using a lot of CPU or disk, running compression tools, you know, turning on persistent mechanisms like extra things launching, opening network ports. You know, these are clues that somebody has managed to put a remote access Trojan on the box and they're doing something bad. Um, there's malware. You know, if you have some kind of clue, like if an anti-malware product detects malware somewhere, then you have now a time and a date when something happened. So you can look for what else happened during that time um, and see, you know, what other events happen in that time, and that will help you find indicators of compromise and start tracking down through the network to see what happened. Um, they may, many people do not use malware anymore because they get caught. They use living off the land, but you might find things like they've copied a cmd.exe to a different folder or named something cmd.exe in a different folder that is not a legitimate cmd.exe and so on. So you just look for abnormal um, login times. And if you're gonna do that, then you probably should automate that process. It would be a drag to do it one by one on all the devices. You could probably write a script that will query the domain controller or another device to get a list of all the login times and then quickly exclude the normal ones and so on. Uh, you, you could make a list of the logins, say before the time you're interested in and call that normal, and then a list at the times of suspect and, and find the difference, that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do this, a lot of methods, external resources, manual. Um, you have to minimize the data. This is a big deal. As you see in the Splunk projects, you have a million records and you have to somehow filter that down to the 10 records of interest. You can't deal with huge amounts like that. So uh, there's a lot of external resources to help you. There are repositories of known files so that if you find files that match these hash values, you know that they are harmless, normal software from Microsoft or other trustworthy vendors, and you don't have to waste your time analyzing those files anymore. Um, Bit9 was one of the anti-malware companies, but they actually got hacked. And then their product was being used to spread malware, so that's something to know about. That is a problem. 
Uh, so these external resources, sometimes they're wrong, but most of the time they help. You just have to remember never to trust any of your tools too much. All your tools have defects. VirusTotal is the standard way to test files. You can upload files or you can just send up hash values and then they don't have a copy of the file. Um, and so you might do a manual review of all the files, but you know only for small volumes is that practical. Normally you have to somehow select the important things to focus your attention on. And I mentioned before, you have a lot of tools that help you, but you can't trust any of them too much. All your tools have bugs, all your tools have defects, sometimes your tools have been hacked, and the criminals are always constantly finding ways to confuse your tools. So you just have, if you find anything important, you have to verify it with a second tool. Uh, one thing that, one traditional procedure that one of my forensic trainers said is that you always just use a plain hex editor that just shows you the raw hexadecimal values to make sure that whatever your tool says is really there before you like go to court and try to convict somebody. You gotta verify things with a second tool. All right, so file system metadata will be the directory of all the uh, owners and creation times and files and folder names. So you can start filtering by things down to just things that were created in the time of interest or owned by the user whose account was being used to do the bad thing or something like that to winnow it down. If you don't know exactly what you're looking for, then you can start just making charts uh, and visualizations of the data and look for things that stand out. Uh, there's quite a few tools for that. You can have page views, number of visitors, categories of devices, you know, just make charts of various measurements of what's happening. And then you can look like here, something, a lot of page views at this time. So something strange is happening at this time. This is nothing's really standing out here. You know, this is, you look along various dimensions for outliers, be one thing you can do. Hunting for some indicators of compromise. And then if you find something like a file name or a URL that's interesting, then you can use that to find more things that are involved. That's how it works. So you get a list of things relevant to the case. You get names, IP addresses, domain names, file names, registry keys. You find some strings that are involved in the case. Then you search all your data for those strings and find more things. And then you're finding more indicators of compromise. And then you take those and scan it again. And when you aren't finding any new strings to search for, then you call your investigation over. This is a standard technique. I've seen it done in physics and in higher mathematics. When you have a very difficult problem and you cannot absolutely solve it, you come up with a procedure to go from nowhere to what appears to be closer to the answer. And you repeat that until you've gone as far as you can. And then you say, well, there's no point wasting more time. My method can't get me any closer to the answer than this. That is some degree of success. This is often what you have to settle for. You can't really prove that you've got 100% success. But uh, that is the way you can spend a reasonable amount of time and have a reasonable degree of success without uh, wasting too much time beating your head against the wall. And so uh, I mentioned the unallocated blocks of storage devices often contain portions of deleted files, although on modern SSDs, they often do not because the SSDs automatically delete the unallocated space. But magnetic hard drives keep it and some SSDs do. So your forensic suites, like in case and FTK, will automatically search them and let you look in that stuff. Um, you can reconstruct files and the expensive forensic tools and, and uh, Sleuth Kit will automatically do this. They will automatically carve files, although they almost always do it in a very simple way. They, if they find a JPEG header and a JPEG footer, they just assume that all the blocks in between are that JPEG. They don't make any attempt to deal with holes in it. So you often get images with strange gaps and breaks in the middle of them. But anyway, most of the time it works. You can reconstruct files, uh, assuming the files are not too big. You, it's usually the case that either the whole file will get overwritten or none of it. Anyway, so that foremost is a tool you can use too. It's in Kali, an easy Linux tool that will automatically reconstruct all the files it can find in an image. All right, and then uh, you evaluate the results. You have to stop periodically and decide, am I getting somewhere or am I wasting my time? This I discover is a big issue in capture the flag contests. I very often am doing something and then I find a problem, then another problem until I'm deep in the weeds, struggling really hard and I realize, you know, I need to just stop and start from the beginning again and try a different angle because it can't be this hard. I'm doing it the wrong way. 
Same thing, of course, happens here. It is your enemy is intelligent. They often have left a clue deliberately to give you the wrong idea, to make you waste your time and go the wrong way. So you really have to be aware of this. Uh, am I really wasting my time going down a blind alley? I did a capture the flag contest a few years ago with one of my most advanced students. In fact, the guy that developed that jailbreak, Check Rain, and he and I spent hours with, we got in this Linux box and it was really weird. We did directories, we executed, we couldn't see what we were doing. And then another student came by and said, that's a honeypot. That's a famous honeypot. You can tell the Linux commands are being simulated. That's why you're not getting them. Or we were going mad because it didn't really make any sense. Only about half the Linux commands worked and the results were sort of inconsistent and we were getting baffled. And you know, we, we could have spent forever on that thing. We weren't gonna get anywhere. That was just a trap to waste your time. And then I participated in the Department of Defense bug bounty program. I think the first one years ago I got in and I, it, was, I, it was all uh, .NET Nuke, which is a Windows-based um, uh, Windows uh, content management system. And uh, I ran a Vuln scanner, we found 300 code execution Vulns, but of course that was just a false positive. It wasn't real. Anyway, so we got a Kahoot coming up. I see Chaz asking a question and I might as well answer. This is a uh, common question. If a, if a, uh, he wanted to go to the gray hat con, all that, and all my stuff is always available here. You go to the old classes link. After things are over, I just move them here. So sure, you can still go to that, all that gray hat stuff. You just go down here. It'll be down here. There it is. It's all still there. So you can all, you, this is where you have to go, go to old classes and you'll find all my old stuff back for like 15 years. That's a good question though. Once things vanish from the front page, it's not like they're gone. They're just moved back there. Good. In case you want to see that old stuff. Of course, the, uh, the bad side is anything more than about a year or two old is probably out of date to not be so out of date as to not be much use. But anyway, it's still up there for what good it may give you. And this is 152 and it's chapter 11, I think. Let me, it is chapter 11. So I should have a cahoot for this. 152 chapter 11, there it is, okay. Nope, that's not the right way. I gotta hit the uh, 152 chapter 11, the play, there we go. All right. All right, good. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. So, which device has no user data? Yeah, the firewall. Data goes through, it'll have a log of the data going through, but it won't keep a copy of the data. All right. All right, which one is expert witness? Yep, E01. It's the number increments. It breaks things up into two gigabyte files, so you'll have a chain of them starting with E01. All right, which disk format is for virtual machines? That's VMDK, that's the VMware one. Microsoft uh, Hyper-V has a different one. 
There's a few of them. All right. What encoding uses uppercase, lowercase, and numbers? A64, which creates data six bits at a time instead of eight. And how do you reconstruct images by using headers and footers? That's called file carving. And you end up being able to see what's inside the file, but you no longer have the creation date or the owner because that information was in the directory and that's gone. Anyway, all right. Mm -hmm. That's a real name. That's a real name too. Good. By the way, if somebody here has got the initial CC, let me know. That was someone who deserved extra credit, and I didn't get the real name enough. So let me know if they are here. Anyway, I'm going to stop the video. Let me put it up.